Your homework is to memorize this and write it 15 times. Welcome to the coolest, fittest half hour of fun on TV. This is Brain Stew with Jennifer Floyd. Um, uh, are you sitting down? Uh, yeah. What episode of Brain Stew is your all-time favorite? This week, Brain Stew talks to some of our viewers about their all-time favorite shows. Hey, remember when we went to La Rey Cavern? H how about our trip to the Snake Pit to learn all about reptiles? Here's another favorite. We went aboard the USS Enterprise and got our brain stewed with Newton's Three Laws of Motion. Hey, you on the couch, put down the remote, and let's check out some of Brain Stew's all-time favorites. Hey, you guys. My name is Jennifer Pulley, and welcome to Brain Stew. You know, this is my all-time favorite way to watch Brain Stew. Chilling on the couch with a beverage and some eats. You know, since we're doing an all-time favorite episode of Brain Stew, I invited a few kids over to find out their favorite Brain Stew episode. Meet Brandon. Hi. Jen. Hi. Marie. Hi. And Gary. Hi. Boy, we're excited to be here today. All right, you guys comfortable? All right, got your drinks, everything's cool? All right, let's get down to business. Okay, who's first? Okay, we don't have any takers, so I'll pick. Brandon. <laughs> What was your favorite Brain Stew episode, Brandon? My favorite Brain Stew episode was when you went to Luray Cavern. Oh, yeah, that was a cool trip. Why'd you like that one so much? Because you learned about some leg types and two Yeah, remember those rocks that were so old? That was awesome. All right, you ready? You gonna fire it up for us? All right, guys, let's check it out. Has Brain Stew got connections or what? We are about to go into the East Coast's largest limestone cave, Luray Caverns. It's amazing. You're not gonna believe it. My friend Rebecca here, Hi, Jen. How are, you? How are you? I'm good. Listen, why is Luray Caverns so special to you? Oh, it's a wonderful caverns. I've been in the caverns business a long time, too. My family has operated this business since 1905. So my family works here, my mother works here, my grandfather, my uncles, and I work here today, too. Wow, and you're going to take me on this tour? I through sure the... am. All right, so I got, a t I got my ticket? Great, let's go. All right. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. All right, great. Go down, down, down. Now, Rebecca, who discovered the Ray Caverns and when? Well, on August 13th of 1878, three men from the town of Ray, Mr. Andrew Campbell, Mr. Uh, William Campbell, and Mr. Benton Stebbins, felt cool currents of air coming from some cro uh, rocks in the ground, and uh, they realized that was the entrance to a, a large cavern, so they began to dig away and clear away the rocks and lower each other down into this uh, vast wonderland. And, and, and I see that little um, sign up there. Yes. Is that kind of where they came down? Yes, it was. They were lowered down by rope, and all they had to light their way were lanterns. We didn't, of course, have lights back then when they came down, so all they had were light, uh, gas lanterns to light their way. What's the temperature in a cavern? The cavern stays the same temperature all year round. It's always 54 degrees, and uh, the humidity is very high, so it feels a little bit warmer and makes your hair a little sticky. Oh, <laughs> that natural curl coming on back now. <laughs> Rebecca, it looks like there's like a mirror right here. Yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah, what is It's not a mirror, is it? No, it's not. It actually looks like it's about three or four feet deep, but it's only about six inches deep. And what's happening is when the rain falls, it's seeping down through the Earth's surface and coming down through all this rock. It picks up little tiny minerals on the way down. And that's why these little tiny formations are beginning to form. As the water drips through the ceiling of the caverns, uh, mineral deposits are left leaving little tiny soda straws is what they call. They look like icicles. Mm -hmm. what they mean. And what happens is when the minerals form, sometimes it gets clogged up in there and the minerals get uh, stuck in there. And so then they start, the water starts to redirect and come around the outside of the soda straws, uh -huh. making more of a carrot-shaped formation. And that's when the real beginnings of a stalactite start. Me. No. And, and, do you, and what is the, all this water called? Do you guys call it anything? It's called the Dream Lake. And uh, as you said, it makes a perfect mirror reflection of the ceiling. It's beautiful. Oh, look, 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 look that's stalactite. And that stalagmite they're getting ready to meet. I oh, know, it's almost there. It's so close. Still going to take a lot of it's years. It's going to take a long time. What's a stalactite? The one going down from the top is a stalactite. Okay. And they, we call them stalactite because they hang tight to the ceiling. That's a good way to remember it. I think I teach my kids that. Yeah. And well, what about stalagmite? Stalagmite is coming up from the ground, and that's formed from the drippings that the stalactite makes. And it kind of builds up from the bottom, from the floor up. Now, when they meet? They meet, they make a column. 
I'm so one a continuous piece from floor to ceiling. Cool. And again, a couple hundred more years until... Yeah, we might have it there. <laughs> Rebecca, I mean, Dream Lake is just awesome. I mean, that's just incredible. I mean, this is... What is this? Well, this is great. Now, Den, we're starting to get into the larger parts of the caverns. This is called the Pluto's Chasm. It's one of the largest chambers here that we have. It's about 500 feet long, about 70 to 90 feet deep. And it's where the main channel of water was flowing through here about 400 million years ago, breaking up this cavern and uh, turning it into these large rooms. When you say it's Pluto, are we talking like Mickey's dog? No, nah, a lot of people think so. But <laughs> <laughs> um, it's Pluto, the ancient god, Roman god of the underworld is uh, what it's named, since we are under the world. But what are the different colors in the cave? Well, the green is one of the only living things we have here in the caverns. It's uh, the algae growing because of the light. The heat from the lights makes the algae grow, and as you know, it's a plant, so that's the, why that's growing there. We have a few other colors, too. You can see the white, that real snowy white. Yeah, what's that? That's made from calcium carbonate. The reddish, brownish color is coming from iron. And this is all in the water that's dripping through, is that correct? That is correct, okay. and whatever uh, minerals that the water picks up is what deposits, you know, the color it's going to deposit. Yoo-hoo! We're down here. <laughs> <laughs> now, what is this big white calcium carbonate? Yes. Right? This, what is this? This is the Pluto's ghost. As I mentioned before, the Pluto's chasm is down here. And down in the center is the Pluto's ghost. Yes. Again, named for the Roman god of the underworld. Um, and it's called the ghost because we see it three times on our tour today at different angles of the cavern. So. You can see it once from up there, uh -huh. where, where, where Mike is, and then once from right here, yep. and once from the top of the chasm over there. And this, we're still inside this, and this is where the water was flowing. Inside. Right, coming off through, through here. Through mm -hmm. here. Now, Rebecca, I know, we're kind of getting a little splashed here. <laughs> no, it feels like it's raining, doesn't it? Yeah, what is this formation called? This is called flowstone. And as you can tell, as the water drips down, it kind of splashes all over everywhere. Yeah. And uh, it doesn't really have a distinct uh, rhyme or reason or pattern, so it flows everywhere. And that's why it's called flowstone. And it's all wet. I mean, it's all yeah, wet. Yeah, it's wet. wet. Mm -hmm. I see there's white in it, uh -huh. so I guess that, that that means that there's... There's more calcium deposits, right? Some calcium. This, this orange now, that's not calcium. No, it's not. This is the iron that we talked about earlier. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and look, and you can even see the drips. Uh huh. Isn't yeah. that cool? Oh, I'm just great. Splash. Me too. Let's get out of here. <laughs> that was so cool. I love that episode. Yeah, that was really awesome. Good choice, Brandon. That was so cool. Yeah, man, that was awesome. All right, well, you know what? Since Brandon watches Brain Stew here all the time, you know what's next? Brain Stream. You got it. All right, while you strain your brain, we'll be right back with Jen. We're going to find out what her favorite Brain Stew episode is. Back in a few. Okay, welcome back to Brain Stew's all-time favorite episode. Okay, Jen, you had the entire commercial break here to think of your favorite episode. You got one? Oh, yes. My favorite episode is when you went with the U.S. Coast Guard on a rescue mission. Oh, yeah, that was awesome. That was awesome. Yeah, that was our show on um, navigation. Yeah, we learned all about how helicopters fly. Why did you like that one? Because I always wondered how helicopters, you know, they could just lift up and someone, I don't know why, they could just navigate them. Yeah, it seems kind of strange. All right, you, you ready? Yeah. You got the remote in your hands. Let's check it out, guys.
Uh, right now we're heading to the north. We're picking up the uh, Dismal Swamp Canal, but we're also having uh, a fly to point uh, that John put into the computer, which tells us where we're going. Uh, so if we needed to, we could just use that HSVD we talked about earlier, the horizontal situation visual display, which will point us exactly where we need to go. And that's how we normally would fly when we were going to a specific position that was passed to us, is, is using the fly to point that shows up here on the screen. We also have this handy little book. You saw the line long for everything around here, pretty much. Kind of gets helps us uh, save a lot of time from looking on our charts. And of course, line long is uh, what we refer to as the latitude longitude you were asking about earlier. real rescue mission? That's a good question. Actually, no, no, most of you guys probably know. No, it really wasn't, but, you know, the United States Coast Guard does practice SAR missions, which is S-A-R, search and rescue missions, to help people if they're in trouble on the water. Um, so next time you guys are out on the water, you know your latitude and longitude, don't you? Okay, who's got the remote? Who's... Ah, Jen. Okay. Who's next? Hmm. Gary. Uh, I thought we were supposed to go to brain strain now. Uh, Come on, no, no. Good no. try, Gary. Oh, no, 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 no. What was your favorite episode? Um, I love that episode on the snakes. Oh, yeah. But my mom really hates them. You know, I used to hate snakes, too. I mean, slimy, gross. But, you know, until I learned more about them, I, I gained a new respect for them. All right, Gary, roll the slimy snake tape. Hey, you guys, I'm here with my friend Chris and Pat in the snake pit. Mm. Guys, what's a snake? I see two of them here. What you're holding is an eastern king snake, and Pat has a common boa. And these are both good examples of snakes. I think everybody... He's got me. Yeah, he's got hold of me. <laughs> I think the first thing everyone uh, looks at to recognize a snake is its body shape. Sure. It's a very elongated body, but there's some other characteristics that you really need to look at to know whether you're looking at a snake or not. Uh-huh. But first of all, a snake is cold-blooded. And what that means is that the snake uh, its body temperature and activity level depends on the temperature around it. So the cooler it gets, warm. yeah, you would feel. You know, he's trying to wrap around you and, and nestle in there because uh, he's probably getting a little cool out here in the room. Uh, a snake, besides being cold-blooded, is also a vertebrate. Now, believe it or not, we see how this snake is really winding all around. Winding around. There is a spine or backbone in there. It's just very, very flexible. Uh, to allow for the snake's unusual uh, movements. Uh, the third thing we could say a snake is, besides being cold-blooded and being a vertebrate, is that it belongs to the group of animals that we call reptiles. So besides a snake, that would also include the lizards and the turtles. They would be relatives of, of the these, snake. Mm -hmm. Of the snake. Okay, yeah, because his skin to the touch is not slimy. No. It's dry. It's kind of scaly. That's right. So one of, we know that one of the characteristics of being a reptile is the fact that you have uh, these scales. Yeah. So besides the scales, a reptile would also uh, lay a tough shelled egg to protect it. And there would be some other characteristics as well, but those are the, the two. The, the dry scaly skin is the one that you can obviously see here. Uh, and then there are certain ways that you're going to tell uh, a snake from other animals too. And maybe uh, it's 
Pat, you want to just pull the bow up a little bit, maybe if we can uh, Now this is a, a boa constrictor. Yes, mm -hmm. right? Boa constrictors are found in Central and South America. Another snake that's very similar to the boa constrictor is a python, and you would find pythons in Africa and Asia and places like that. So we're not going to find any of these around here in our area? Not, not one of these. No, no. but we will find this eastern king snake. You will yes. find the king snake? Yes. Hey Chris, I know what's inside of my body. What's inside a snake's body? Well, it, they're some of the same parts that we have. Uh, mentioning that they are vertebrates, meaning they have a backbone. I have a nice model here where you can see all the vertebrae in those tiny little ribs. Is that kind of what ours looks like? Well, uh, they got a lot more ribs than, yeah. than we do. <laughs> uh, and you can see that the head end up here with the skull and the jaws. So we have those same parts as well. And when you get all the way back here to the tail, they're just uh, vertebrae without any ribs uh, down here here at the end and in fact the first couple vertebrae up here by the skull don't have any ribs either so that they can have good flexibility of their head which is important for a snake because we know one of the things that we recognize about a snake is that it doesn't have any limbs and so it's yeah. got to be able to to move that body around. How do snakes move? Well but the way evidently their muscles are attached between the vertebrae and the ribs kind of work like you would be using ropes and pulleys to move their body along and they're able to kind of work those ribs and the scales on their body can grip the ground and, and they can uh, work themselves along. If we kind of go back to the outside of the snake, you won't notice any ear opening. So that's something else. Yeah, yeah, they don't have ears like we do. Right. No, they don't have the external ear. They don't have the, the opening on the outside. And that's something that will help you to distinguish a snake uh, from other reptiles. So you have to look not just at the body shape and the sure. fact it doesn't have limbs, yep. but the, some of these other characteristics too, which on the outside mainly would be whether or not it's got those, those ear openings. See you guys? Snakes aren't that bad. I guess so, but they're still disgusting. They're gross. So. I know. I mean, nothing can change that. <laughs> that was a good episode. Good job. All right, guys, what's next? Mm. Um, I know, I know. Brain strain! Uh -huh. We'll be right back. Was your brain strained? Hope so. Okay, by process of elimination, <laughs> Marie, it's your turn. My favorite one was when you guys visited USS Enterprise. Yeah, that was our show. When we did a show on workforce, motion, and energy. We learned about like Newton's three laws of motion. And Why was it your favorite show? Because when they took off and they're on these little tiny runways and the boat is still moving. Yeah, it was amazing. It was really cool. Are right, you guys ready to check it out? I think Marie knows what to do at, at this point, right? Everybody's done. All right, let's go. Hey, you guys, I'm out on the flight deck at the USS Enterprise. This is so cool. I can't see land anywhere, Vern. <laughs> kind of scary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, now, I obviously have on my um, float coat in case That's I right. want to be blown overboard. But I just ain't mine, so I'm too heavy to be blown overboard at this point. Uh, anyway, listen, I wanted to ask you a question about motion. Sure. Um, I know when we talk about motion, you have to talk about the concept of speed, right. velocity, and acceleration. How does the USS Enterprise incorporate speed, velocity, and acceleration into, into the running of the ship? Well, uh, primarily on the flight deck, we're interested in getting the aircraft off the deck. So sure. <laughs> uh, on land, you have a large runway, where here we have a very short runway. Our catapults are 249 feet long. So we need to accelerate uh, a large object, in this case a jet aircraft, sure. from a velocity of zero, or a speed of zero, to a speed that's capable of sustaining flight uh, in a, a distance of only 249 feet. So we do that using our, our steam-fired catapults. Yeah, then now the energy that this catapult gets is not electrical energy. No, it's not. How do, how do, you, how do you guys power the catapult? Well, the ship has several nuclear, nuclear reactors. Yep. The nuclear reactors generate steam. The steam is used to propel the catapults. Underneath these uh, catapult troughs, you see here, if we were to lift these covers away, uh -huh. you'd see two long cylinders about 18 inches in diameter. Inside the cylinders rides a huge piston assembly that's about 12 to 15 feet long. The, the entire assembly underneath there weighs 4,200 pounds, with this piece that protrudes above the deck being where we attach the aircraft to. Okay. Now Are we going to see that later? Oh, yes. Okay, great, great. Now, uh, the back the back side of these piston assemblies, which are inside the cylinders, are concave, just like pistons in a car engine or whatever. Okay. The steam is I see it. taken in, steam. right, uh -huh. it, it comes in at, the, at that end of the catapult, and uh, it pushes against the pistons, drives them forward, 
pulling that entire assembly that weighs 4,200 pounds, plus the aircraft, which can weigh up to 70,000 pounds, down this catapult track. And uh, in that short distance, 249 feet, we can accelerate uh, a 70,000 pound Tomcat from zero to about 145 miles per hour in two and a half seconds. Wow. Open angle, start engine, six months, three, five, four. All right, we'll get that. Now, as you saw on the nose wheel of the jet, there's a, uh, what we call a launch bar. It's a T-shaped bar that yeah. fits, fits right down in this slot. Oh, look at that. It's all lubricated, yes, I it's, guess. Uh, we have to keep it lubricated. There's a lot of oil. Uh, you don't want any friction. There. Exactly. You know, friction, <laughs> friction's bad. All right. And uh, when it gets here, obviously, the catapult stops and the motion continues of the, uh, the aircraft. And the jet is full force ahead. I mean, they're exactly. just, the pilots are just gunning it, right? Yes, okay. yes they're so, full power. So with that full power plus the, the, this catapult, that's what actually gets these planes off the flight deck. It provides them enough forward momentum, inertia. Wow, yes. Maybe some health and fitness. Got any ideas? I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to get some good arm exercises. <laughs> and a mouth exercise. Look at that thing. Well, we need some real exercise. How about a bike ride? Oh, yeah. Hey, you guys, remember when we went to the Great Dismal Swamp on that bike ride? Oh, yeah, I remember yeah. that. Yeah. Remember that, yeah. that was cool. You know, well, how about that? Why don't we do that? That'll give us some health and fitness. We won't feel so guilty about sitting here being couch okay. All right, who's got the remote? I it! <laughs> OK, uh, it's my show. <laughs> Let me have the remote. Let's go. <laughs> hey you, have you ever visited a national wildlife refuge, kind of like the Dismal Swamp? Well, it's a great place to visit, but you know what? You can't drive through it. So you gotta think of other ways. This is my buddy Chuck. How are you doing, Chuck? I'm doing good. Uh, how can we get through the Dismal Swamp then if we can't use our car? Well, we can use these bicycles, or we can canoe in, we can kayak in, or we can come by a small boat. Wow, that's incredible. You know, I have a friend that's been known to skydive. Over the Dismal Swamp? Yeah. I wouldn't recommend it. Okay. Told you there were many ways to get into a swamp. Now, today we're going to switch gears and we're going to actually take a bike ride through the swamp. So, Chuck, you need to, to fill me in here. What, what are some of the things that I need? We need to take a bike trip into Okay. The swamp? First, obviously, we need these bicycles. All right. We want to have a bike with nice fat tires so they can ride over the uneven terrain without any problem. All righty. We need helmets on our heads for safety reasons, of course. Protect my big brain. Yeah. Now, out here, uh, we're out here in the middle of the summer and it's kind of warm, so we both brought water bottles on our bikes. Yep. And I have a couple of additional bottles on this pack right here as well. Now, a couple of things I always like to bring also are a pump. This comes right off here. In case I, we I get, get a flat tire? In case I get a flat tire, I can fix it. I carry a, a few tools and a little patch kit. There's a patch kit. And there's some tools. Gosh, you just loaded. What if I get a cut or a scrape? Well, I could, could go get my uh, little first aid kit, which is a little bit further down in here, along with a spare inner tube. I'm, spare and, inner tube? Are we, right? we going to go swimming? Well, for the bike. Jennifer? We're prepared to go. Now, besides being able to see the Great Dismal Swamp and all the plants and animals that live here, bike riding itself also has tremendous health benefits. You ready to take off? I'm ready. All right, I'll follow you. Yes. The longer we ride and the faster Chuck makes me ride, <clears throat> this increases my heart rate. And your heart, what that means is your heart starts beating faster and faster. Your heart's a huge muscle. And the faster you make it beat, the stronger it becomes. Right, Chuck? That's right. Yeah, right. How's your heart rate? My heart rate's great. Mm -hmm. We're working our heart muscle. We're also working other muscles. Chuck, you know what other muscles we're working? Well, we're working our legs quite a bit. You're exactly right. We're working our quads, which are right here, which are like our thighs. And we're also working our hamstrings, which are back here. All right. You sweating yet? A little bit. Oh, me you? too, me too. Oh man, it's nice and shady right here. Why don't we stop and get a drink? 
Oh, yeah, well, tell me why, again, why do we bring this water? I know it tastes good and all, but... Well, we want to stay well hydrated because we're putting out a lot of sweat on this hot day. All right. Uh, cheers. Yeah. So, the next time you're in a national wildlife refuge like the Great Dismal Swamp, you can work both your brain and your heart. I'll see you on the bike trail. Chuck, thanks so much. Hey, see you later. I yeah. love exercise for I know, yeah. my legs yeah. got a workout. Yeah, my legs are killing me. All right, well, you know what? I'll take it from here because this is all the time we have and this is it. Till next week, you guys keep that big brain of yours doing because you never know what you'll learn. All right, girls, you're going to roll the credits? I'll do it. Cool. Move it. water with the mop. <laughs> with the mop. <laughs> with the mop. <laughs> that works. Now, add enough food coloring to make each color a dark. <laughs> <laughs> we had to get you a group because you're just too perfect. <laughs> How do the animals, I mean. <laughs> hey, wasn't he a favorite? <laughs> a favorite. <laughs> He wasn't here, famous.